Hi everyone, welcome to episode 15. My guest today is BJJ Black Belt and runs the GFT Punta Cana in Dominican Republic, Calum Calista. Today's episode is also brought to you by Guard Players Open Jiu-Jitsu Championship. It will be held on April 27th. This is a gi-only event in Ottawa, Ontario, Canada. There is adults, masters, seniors, youth, teens, juniors, and kids divisions. Go check them out on Facebook. You'll have all the details for the BJJ event and tournament. You could also go check them out if you need more information at info at guardplayersopen.com we're super happy that we're going to be able to have the podcast logo on the podium banner and we get to work directly with the guard players staff um so go check them out make sure you uh, sign up to the tournament it's going to be a great event it's time to high five and fizz bump a jujitsu podcast for the everyday grappler let's talk subs let's talk positions let's talk dominating the mat welcome to the let's talk jujitsu podcast with raymond terrence So my guest today is a BJJ black belt and runs the GFT Academy in Punta Cana, Dominican Republic, called Basico Punta Cana. Kalem Kalista, let's talk jiu-jitsu. It's a pleasure to be on, man. Finally, nice to catch up with you. We've been trying to do this for a while. And I know, it's crazy. <laughs> <laughs> hey, everyone's really busy. I have to tell you that out of all the academy owners that uh, you know we have on and I, and I contact and we're trying to make dates, I, I think I have a bucket of like maybe 30 or 40 that are all very down for doing the podcast but trying to make like the time frames work sometimes is a little hard but uh, but finally we have you on so that's good news <laughs> yeah it's hard to be on now it's a pleasure good okay so maybe tell us uh, a little bit about uh, yourself and how you got started in jiu-jitsu uh jiu-jitsu uh, for basic same, same story like a, a lot of people you know i voice gracie you know uh seeing this little skinny guy in UFC 1 uh, destroying everybody with jiu-jitsu. Like, as soon as I saw him, I was hooked, you know. I, I went and signed up right after that, you know. What academy did you start training out of? started with um, a, uh, um, a, 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 sorry, my tongue died. Um, I, got, I started off with um, a Delaware School out of Chicago. Like, well, I say Chicago, but Northwest Indiana. It's Merrillville, Indiana probably about 15 minutes from Chicago. And I trained there all the way up until uh, Purple Belt and then um, moved here to the Dominican. And that's where I met Abraham Marte and uh, affiliated with him. And then I've been with him ever since. Oh, that's really cool. How long have you been in uh, Dominican Republic for? Roughly eight years now. Okay, so that's quite, that's quite a bit of time. And so, so and before that, you're, you're initially from the States, right? Yeah, yeah, I was uh, raised in uh, East Tennessee. Okay, okay, great. Like and about 48 miles from Knoxville, Tennessee. Okay, cool. And what brought you to, uh, to Punta Cana? Originally, I came here for work. Um, I'm in the promotions business and uh, started um, managing like casinos here. And then, you know, there really wasn't nothing for, for training here, you know. The, uh, so I uh, ended up bringing just mats here and I would just mess around like on the rooftop of my house and about after two months of being here, a guy opened a um, Muay Thai gym, and I rushed down there just basically offering to teach jiu-jitsu for free just to kind of get training partners, and it kind of took off. No, that's great. How, how long have you had uh, your academy for? Well, I stayed there for about a year with that gym, and then it just got too big, and we uh, went off so roughly about uh, six years. I've had my academy here. Didn't really want to be a professor, didn't want to teach, but, you know, it was like the only way I could really do any jiu-jitsu here. And then it just kind of got to where I got some loyal students and we kind of built a pretty solid competition team out of it. Oh, that's really cool. That's really cool. And, and how, how was jiu-jitsu like when you first started jiu-jitsu, you know, like growing up as maybe like a, a blue belt or a purple belt? Um, you know, how, how, how was jiu-jitsu then? Is it much different than you're experiencing jiu-jitsu now? Man, it's so, so much different. Like, for example, um, like I used to travel back and forth from Georgia to Chicago. So uh, when I was in Georgia to, for me to train, and I did this now, this for about four and a half, almost five years, um, I had to drive an hour and a half to train and an hour and a half back, wow. five days a week, every day. There was one black belt in the area, 
and he was uh, about two and a half, three hours from where I live. So I spent the majority of my career, like the highest belt I had ever even seen was a brown belt, you know, and now it's like, man, there's so many black belts everywhere. There's so much like access to knowledge now, you know, I mean, when I started, you had to buy an instructional DVD, you know, there wasn't many jujitsu things on YouTube, stuff like that, you know, so, you know, uh, if, you, if you didn't have a black belt in your academy, you know, you were really limited, you know. Right, so I guess you were just learning off of each other at the time. Pretty much, yeah. That, that's kind of what it was. You know, there was a couple guys that were really... Uh, are you still there? Yeah. Okay, sound like I lost something. Anyway, any, but there was a couple guys that were really just loyal and kind of diehard jiu-jitsu guys. My son, for example, um, he pretty much started jiu-jitsu, you know, around the same time I did. And uh, he was about 11, 12 years old at the time. He's been my best training partner up, in, up until now. He's... Uh, to 20, 22 years old now, and just just went to Pan and uh, ended up losing in the second round. But he's he's a monster. He's a beast. Oh, that's cool. And what uh, what rank is he? He's a purple belt. Now. He's a purple belt. Okay, that's cool. That's really good. So I guess you know having your son around, you're, you're you know at least you have like a guaranteed training partner at all times, basically. Yeah, man, it's been great. Like so we we fed off of so off of each other so much, you know. So it's it really pushes me to get better because he's on my heels constantly, you know. And you know you know how it is that he, he wants to take over the crown and beat dad. So <laughs> I'm constantly, you know, I'm 39 here, he's 22. So I'm having to really put in work every day to stay on my toes, you know. Nice, nice. So may, maybe just give us an idea of what your what your first BJJ classes were like when you were a student. Do you, do you remember anything, you know, first starting off uh, at, at the first academy and your first classes as a white belt? You know, I think it's it's really strange now because, you know, like I travel a lot to compete and doing seminars and stuff. And I see a lot like it's so saturated in a lot of these cities and stuff now. Like it was so much about like like the name of my gym. It's uh, it's Basico, which in Spanish translates to basic. And, you know, that's what a lot of people are lacking. You know, when we were first starting, we focused so much on basic things like shrimping, framing, you know, all of these things that get neglected today because everybody's seeing, you know, things like Gordon Ryan and these Meow Brothers and stuff with his Brembolo and all this stuff. And that's what fascinates them. You know, you go to a seminar and if you're, I mean, I can spend an hour and a half showing, I, I just did this last time I was in Georgia showing brown and purple belts how to do an arm bar. You know, that you would think you learn right away, but, you know, it's so saturated. People are really preaching to the masses of trying to make money and building, you know, a big gym. or uh, not focusing as much on the, the basics as they are on what everybody wants to see to keep everybody paying for class every month, you know. Yeah, for sure. And I think after talking to a lot of people, when people talk about uh, seminars and things like that, I think the number one complaint that I hear mostly from students is the fact that the seminar was too complicated and they're never going to remember the techniques and it's not something that they could picture themselves doing. So I think students appreciate more and more when a when someone comes in and breaks down, for example, like you said, an arm bar or breaks down a triangle or wants to learn how to you know do yeah. a proper pass and whatnot. I think there's been like maybe like maybe a 360 or maybe a full circle with with all that fanciness and I think things always come back full circle and I think there's a there's a big appreciation for the basics and if you take a look at pans this year uh, which I think we all watched attentively I mean it's it, it's all basics it's a lot of foundation you know what I mean but yeah. passing the guard lots of triangles tons and tons of triangles um, so I think people are coming back to that and realizing that yes that other stuff does work but at a certain point if you don't have your basics then it, 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 it's very hard to transition to anything else Sure. Well, that's the thing, you know, when you've got your basics down, then that's what pure jiu-jitsu is. It's, you know, you, age isn't a factor anymore. Size isn't a factor, you know. Um, you don't see many uh, guys in their 40s rim bowling and things like that, you know. But, you know, if you've got, as if, you've, if, you've, if you're familiar with my instructor, Abraham Marte, he's got one of the best uh, closed guards in jiu-jitsu. And that's something, you know, that's, he focuses a lot on basics and, you know, that's some transitions. He's the same age as me. He's uh, nine now and he competes in the adult division and uh, does very well, you know, because like I say, it's a lot of basics. That's what we, we focus on, control, things like this. Everybody's so worried about passing the guard instead of 
all the new cast, you know, it's, it's a, a different era, you know. Right, right, definitely. So, so if people were to think of you, I, did you have a, maybe a certain style uh, of jujitsu, like maybe uh, some some fundamentals or maybe a specific technique that, that you say it's kind of your thing? You know, if people think about you when you're competing or when you're rolling, do you have things that you like to go to specifically? That's basically your go-to moves. Oh yeah, definitely close guard. I mean, I'm old school in that sense. Like, I feel like close guard is such a, a controlling and attack position, and I feel like that's a mistake a lot of people do. Is you know, anytime you're rolling, you'll see these guys, they'll be, you know, working hard, trying to pass the guard or trying to sweep and they get somebody to close guard and they use that as a rest. You know, you feel, you hear them like, ah, ah, you know, they take that breather there and that's kind of where they relax. And then same on the, on the passing end, they, you know, when they get caught in the close guard, that's where they kind of relax as where I, I try to teach, the, uh, teach and treat closed guard as, as such an attacking position that that's not a rest. You know, I'm trying my whole time to get to that closed guard position and use that as constantly attacking. Yeah, that's that's really good. I have to say that uh, as a purple belt, that's a philosophy that I, I I've really kept in my head that I learned from another black belt when I went to a BJJ camp, and he explained it the exact same way that 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 you did. That a lot of people assume that the close guard is a resting position, but if you're in close guard, I mean that's your attacking point. I, the more you're attacking, the less your opponent has an opportunity to pass and do other things because he's just focusing on on defending all of your attacks. So, yeah, definitely that's something that um, that I kind of worked myself actually trying to really ingrain that in my head that it's not a resting spot it's a it's it's a time to attack or to sweep and to get my opponent off guard so it's nice to see that that you know that's still around you know especially at a black belt level because you know, I mean you, you you watch a lot of black belt uh, matches uh, whether it be IBJJF or other tournaments and it, people seem to stall out a lot in 50 50 and there's not much action because everything's you really finally calculated sure. but but when when you have a close guard I mean you don't really have a choice you, you have to sweep or it. You can't just sit there for five minutes or six minutes, right? Yeah, that's true. That's Definitely. Really, that's really cool. That's why I say, like, I always attribute, uh, um, you know, my, my a lot to my growth because, you know, uh, like I said, I came here when I was a purple belt. And I tell everybody I didn't start learning jujitsu until I was a purple belt, you know, under his tutelage because he really uh, focuses on on the basics. And I mean, you know, it, it's a, you got to be humble to be a purple belt. And relearn how to shrimp, you know, relearn how to how to frame, how to do an arm bar. You know, if I come there and I say, hey, uh, um, show me how to do an arm bar, I say, you know, you, you don't do an arm bar right. You know, purple belt as many years as you've trained and said you think to yourself, like, I, I definitely know how to do an arm bar right. You know, but a lot of people don't have that, uh, how do you say, that, that, that humbleness to just um, accept if they don't really know something, you know, to go back and really focus on the basics. Everybody, once they get to, to blue, to purple, especially brown, they kind of forget about that. Just, you know, focus on the new popular technique. Yeah, for sure. My my actually professor uh, a few months ago, uh, out of nowhere for some odd reason, what I was whenever he was trying to pass my guard uh, or he was almost passed, I would always... Uh, shrimp into him instead of shrimping away from him. I don't know where this came from. It came out of nowhere. And then when he when he when he looked at me, he's like, I don't understand why you're shrimping into me. I keep taking your back. And I'm like, I'm a purple belt. Like, shouldn't I know? Like to shrimp away? I've always shrimped away. Why am I shrimping into him now? You know what I mean? It makes no sense. And at purple belt, I'm like, <laughs> Sh shouldn't I be a better like jujitsu practitioner at this point? But I'm always like humbled by how I'm back to square one like all of a sudden out of nowhere. <laughs> Yeah, but it's like just last time my instructor was here training with me, he was showing um, uh, my class, like, you know, just a, a basic, like, inversion drill to kind of recover your guard. And he's like, he's like, here, Caleb, uh, you know, here, do it like this. And I did, and he's like, no, you're doing it wrong. You know, and, and me, right away, I'm defensive. I'm thinking, like, you know, I've been training jiu-jitsu all the years. I know how to recover my guard, you know. So at first, I was, like, blocking all of that, you know, like, I know what I'm doing. But you know, he, he, he switched a couple things that I was doing with my hips. And dude, just right there, my, my guard recovery game leveled up much. And like you say, it's tough, especially like the game of black to accept some of the basic that you learned probably in your first two weeks of you just, you've been doing wrong your whole life. Right. You know what I mean? So if you can accept that, that's the best way to grow, you know? Sometimes, you know, everybody hates the guy that speaks the truth. 
nobody wants to hear somebody tell you how bad you are, how, how much you suck at something, but that's really the guy that you need to have around you. Our, our society, we keep people around, you know, that constantly build us up and say, oh, you're great, you're amazing, everything you do is wonderful. And those are the people who keep around us, but those are not people that are building us up to get better. You know, my instructor doesn't, won't blow your head up for nothing. I mean, my first year at Brown Belt, I won, I was the number one ranked uh, Brown Belt in the world at Master One and won everything. Pan Ams, Third at Worlds, um, American Nationals, Double Gold. And the guy, and he never one time told me, good job. You know, after every match, he criticized what I did wrong. But that's what got me better. Right. No, no, that's that's, that's, that's that's really well said. And is is uh, Professor Marte? He where, where is he based out of? He's in Santa Domingo. It's about uh, two and a half hours from from where I'm at. Okay, okay, okay. So he's still close. Does he come by the academy from time to time? Yeah, pretty much every other week we're training together. Oh, that's cool. Oh, that's really cool. Nice. And are 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 you more of a gi or a no gi type of guy? It's funny you say that. I'm. I train probably ninety percent gi, but I've accomplished a lot more uh, in no gi. Wow, that, that's really. So I don't know how that works. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, because I, I I follow you obviously on Facebook on social media. I know you put, you know you tend to post a lot of videos and whatnot, and uh, I I've been seeing you with rash guards and maybe a little less in the gi. Uh, so yeah, I was kind of curious if you're jumping from back and forth. Yeah. One, one thing that I did notice that I mean you're 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 basically the same age as me. I'm going to be 39 in June, but uh, by by looking at you on Facebook and seeing your physique, you are definitely somebody who keeps in shape. Uh, what what do you uh, uh, work on when it comes to conditioning because uh, I mean you're, you're definitely an active competitor too so someone who obviously owns Academy has to keep up with 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 the younger kids and is competing do you have any type of special routine when it comes to conditioning and uh, show, shout out to, to Tony Pata that's uh, my uh, my fitness my strength and conditioning coach um, the strength sensei you know he's uh, um, uh, a monster man he's he trains the judo national team here in the Dominican for their strength and conditioning and he just, I've learned a lot, you know, because uh, I've lifted pretty much, you know, I've always been an athlete all through um, high school, college, everything. And I lifted, but I didn't, you know, again, like I say, coming to the Dominican, I started learning about lifting when I met him. So for um, grappling sports is a lot different than, say, for basketball or things like that. You know, we're focusing with Tony a lot more on time under tension, you know, so Maybe, let's say, for example, if I'm bench pressing, I may, um, you know, I'll put a lighter weight on there and maybe it'll be one second up and then four seconds down, you know, keeping that weight under tension. Because when you're grappling with somebody, those muscles are under tension for long periods of time. You know, it may stay flexed, you know, grabbing a guy's arm for 15 seconds right there. You need to be able to build up that endurance and that, that strength. Right. And do you do you, do you find yourself doing a lot of cardio? No, uh, I don't do any cardio. The only cardio I do is just rolling. So I don't, you know, I don't run or jog or anything like that. I just, you know, put on, uh, uh, put on and do do a lot of uh, rolling with my students. But you know, mostly just uh, I lift three days a week and train jujitsu five days a week. And then you know, on the weekends, usually if I'm not competing, I'm just uh, resting my body and stuff but you know you really don't need to lift any more than three days a week and it's mostly like i say for injury prevention and since i met tony like i say strength wise i've uh i've never competed against somebody in my division that i felt they were stronger than me that i you know i lost due to strength so that's a big thing i think that really helps you know if two people are equal in skill then strength is going to make a factor the stronger guy is going to win you know right and at black belt that's kind of what you run into a lot is you're getting guys that you're, you know, just one mistake, one little thing ends up winning the match, you know, so you're pretty well evenly matched. So if you have a better gas tank and a little bit better strength, you know, it kind of gives you that little extra edge. Nice, nice. And speaking of that, when it comes to competition, I, I, I noticed that you, you have been competing a lot. Have you always been a very active competitor? I have, yeah, kind of, um, uh, I don't know, it's my blood, it's in my nature, I enjoy it a lot, um, but I've been plagued a lot this past uh, year with injuries, I ended up tearing my meniscus in my knee, and another shout out to Black Belt CBD, I got hooked up with them, 
and been using their products a lot. And I was actually supposed to have surgery on my knee, but just using those those CBD products for the past year, um, it's. I mean, I've had full recovery, and it, my knee is not even an issue now. So I'm 100% ready to compete. I wanted to do Pan Am's this Pan Am's this year, but um, ran into some other issues uh, work wise that I couldn't get the time off. But I'm feeling good. Oh, wow, that's good. Yeah, I think uh, uh, there's a lot of jiu-jitsu guys who are big proponents of CBD. I just recently got on it because I found that my grips, because I play a lot of collar sleeve and I've been playing a lot of worm guard and really trying to develop that game, that my joints are taking a pounding. Like I could, sometimes I was I was barely able to close my hands. So I ordered uh, some CBD oil online, and uh, yeah, I, I feel much better now. Um, when it comes to recovery, do you do anything else than CBD oil to kind of get your body where it needs to be? Massages and acupuncture make a big, big difference. That's okay. usually what I'm doing on the weekends. Like, I'll get a massage once a week and then acupuncture for different parts of my body, you know, that really keep me going. I mean, I used to have a lot of sciatic nerve problems, again, before I got started doing the acupuncture. and started lifting. I mean, lifting makes a big difference. Lifting is, like I say, for the strength-wise and just injury prevention. You know, knowing I was a guy that was more interested in having pretty muscles, you know, so I'm... Um, Lifted bench pressing a lot and never worked at my back, so it was causing me a lot of back problems because of the muscles that muscle imbalances. But I think it's if you're if you're somebody that that, that is training jujitsu for you know a, a lot, wanting to, to be a competitor, it's worth it hiring a personal trainer that knows what he's doing. You know, do your research and find a good guy that can help you with uh, with, with a good lifting program and um, diet and all that because it makes a huge difference. I'd say that's sixty percent, and then. Forty percent is the is the rest, you know. Nice. Does uh, does Tony also give you a um, a like a like a what like a what to eat and a, like a diet or whatnot, or does he just focus on your on your conditioning? No, he, he just pretty much on uh, the strength and conditioning, the diet I do myself. I'm a I'm a diabetic. I've been a um, diabetic for about twelve years now, and it uh, because of that diabetic diet, I kind of keep uh, a, a keto low carb diet and. I swear by that diet. I mean, it really, uh, my performance is never an issue. Cardio's, cardio's never an issue. Um, and, you, and you seem like in my photos, I'm lean. I mean, you know, I don't have very much body fat at all. It's been a very healthy, good diet for me. Yeah, definitely. I, I can definitely relate to that. I started on that uh, January 1st. Uh, obviously, I, I called it a New Year's resolution, but it was more my, my, my wife nagging me that I was eating too much dessert. <laughs> and like I've always been, I guess, a lean type of guy, but I, I guess my, my, my vice was sugar. So I, I decided, okay, I'll cut out sugar, I'll cut out pasta, I'll cut out rice, I'll cut out bread, and let's just see what happens. And I was walking around at like 195 pounds, but I was still feeling good on the mats. I was strong. Um, and then uh, I, I would say after about three or four weeks on that diet, I, I've stuck to it ever since. And I, I'm around 179, 180 pounds, and I feel like like Superman on the mats. It's crazy. Oh, so I can definitely, Congratulations. That's thanks, awesome. Thanks, man. I could definitely relate to that. And I no longer have to cut weight and, and, and be in that stupid medium heavy division, which I hate for the life of me. So, oh, I uh, love that division. That's my division. Oh, yeah. Man. I went down. So <laughs> <laughs> I found that the guys were way too big. Um, so I dropped down to, to middle now. So, you know, if I can compete around 185 or even 180, that's I, I find it like like my sweet spot. Obviously, everyone has their sweet spot. But um, are, are, you so, more, are you more of a point? Um, uh, or a sub only type of guy. I noticed that, that obviously you do everything. Do you have a preference between the two? I prefer submission, you know, but like whatever presents itself. Like I, I train more points, I think, than I do submission. I like to say I'm a points fighter, but last time I said that, I went to Pan Am's and submitted everybody to the final. So, <laughs> you know, it's like whatever happens, I guess. But man, I'll tell you, like you were saying with the. Um, the like for example height wise I'm, I'm six foot three so when i when I, I competed in the middle division as well and i hated it man i got always <laughs> short stocky dudes man that were so freaking strong and just such like hard to control that's a, you know like always been my vice is, is little short stocky guys okay so in medium heavy for some reason i've just it, 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 it seems like it would be opposite like i'd be stronger in the smaller division but I felt really good in this division. And then heavy, I felt pretty good in, in the heavyweight division as well. Okay. Oh, that's really interesting. So maybe give us an idea of what a typical day in the life of Kalem is like. Uh, what does a typical day look like? Oh, Lord. 
it, you think island paradise, you know, that life's simple and everything. But it seems like I never have time for nothing. <laughs> <laughs> well, anyway, I, let's see. I, I get up early for me around 10. And then I'll, I'll go, usually if it's a, a gym day, I'll hit the gym for about two hours. Um, try to squeeze in. Well, uh, um, I'll eat at, well, I eat breakfast before the gym. So then after the gym, I'll eat a lunch. And then pretty much go right into class where I'll teach a drilling class at first, you know, drilling and techniques. And then about an hour, that's for about an hour, hour and a half. And then after that, we roll for about an hour, a good hour, you know, uh, um, just put the timer on and bang like competition style. And then after that, I'll, I'll eat something, go home, take a quick shower and go to work. And I'll get off work at about say mid one o'clock go to sleep and repeat it all again wow that, that's uh, that, that's pretty good did you have time to at least go to the beach you know it's been almost a month since i'm at the beach <laughs> it's crazy you think you know li- living here you go to the beach every day. i mean first year i was here i practically lived on the beach going every day but i mean sometimes like on the weekends and stuff for recovery and all that but not, not, not as often as you would think. You know, it's one of those kind of things you like. You always want to pull. You, know, you always want to go swim. As soon as you get a pull, you're never in. You know. Mm-hmm. No, it's really. Neat. What, what, uh, what, uh, what does a typical uh, jitsu class look like at your academy? Well, I have. Um, I don't really have any much of a beginner class. So all of my guys are pretty much competition. Like I have a big Muay Thai program and boxing program that covers. All the the bills and things that my jiu-jitsu is pretty much all all guys who want to compete and do compete. So all pretty much higher belts and like I said, it's a lot of uh, we do a, uh, like I said, the beginning about an hour of drilling and technique and then a lot of good hard rolling um, and positional sparring. Okay. Do you do you guys do a lot of drilling? Not really. We're more of a uh, like um, you know. I like to drill a little bit just to kind of get the idea, but I feel like you learn more when you hit that technique in live rolling, you know? So I try to tell people like, we'll work a technique a little bit. And then, um, like I try to make it a goal. Like when you roll them with the lower belts or somebody that you're a lot better than really trying to hit that technique during that live roll, you know? Right. Yeah. I was having this, uh, we were having this uh, discussion yesterday with my co-host who unfortunately couldn't be here today, but, uh, I mean, we were, we were just giving an example of two students of a husband and wife and, and the husband was very technical and definitely wants to drill and spends almost next to no time rolling just because of time constraints and work and just it, it just not working out because we usually do uh, a class an hour of technique and then 30 minutes of rolling. Uh, so, you know, at the end of that 30 minutes, you know, because of work, he has to jump out and his wife who trains with him, whose jiu-jitsu is, is getting very, very good. Uh, she spends 90% of her time rolling and 10% doing technique and she's just like flying through it. So we had this big debate, you know, should, should, you know, a beginner spend more time really focusing on technique or is it more beneficial to focus on rolling? But I think everyone has the same, uh, same consensus that, that the more that you experience through rolling, the more that you're going to catch on to things. Definitely. But, um, Kid Dale has a good video on, on that philosophy of uh, rolling versus versus drilling. And uh, I kind of have the same philosophy. I, I like, uh, I, I prefer rolling a lot over uh, just drilling, you know? Yeah, yeah. Actually, I, I, I wanted to pick your brain. Uh, we, we had a discussion yesterday about a uh, John Danaher post. I don't know if you saw it. That he said uh, he posted that 80% of your BJJ roles should be with lower ranking Jiu Jitsu guys to be able to drill your techniques and to perfect them. Do you think there is, uh, you know, a- any truth or any logic behind that? I'll tell you what, if he says it, I, I stand by it. That <laughs> I'm telling you, you know, uh, like I always respected him and his style. And I, and I liked, um, I, I always thought kind of, you know, Gordon was kind of cocky and didn't really like him that much, but. Uh, I went and spent the money and bought um, the the DVD of Danaher's and then uh, the guard passing, the systematically uh, guard passing one of Gordon Ryan's. And man, dude, mind blown. I'm oh, telling yeah? you, these dudes are so technical and just, I mean, 
literally like that, that Gordon Ryan DVD or DVD everything is so technical the way he breaks it down it was just like we were talking nobody breaks stuff down like that anymore hmm. so I mean it's just hours upon hours of really good stuff so if he says it dude I mean I'm gonna go today and I'm gonna roll with all lower belts you know what I mean so <laughs> it's like, this dude definitely knows what he's talking about all right, good. How is the uh, jiu-jitsu scene in the Dominican Republic? Do you have uh, do you have uh, some some local schools around? Is there cross training? Do you have competitions, or how, how how are things out there? It's kind of a mess, you know. Uh, it's same kind of drama like it is in the states, you know. There no schools get along. There was actually just a competition yesterday that I sent my team to, and ended up having to pull my whole team out because uh, they were supposed to be doing IBJJF rules, and the minute we got there, they changed the rules last minute. Oh, no. So it's uh, it, it's a mess. You know, that, that's kind of what's holding the growth back of jiu-jitsu here is that none of the academies really get along and, you know, can't really organize many tournaments. Any of the tournaments we've done are ones I've kind of organized myself, and, you know, and then certain people won't come because they don't get along with, with my professor or my academy, and then... Our academy don't get along with theirs, so it's a lot of the same drama like it is in the states. Yeah, it sounds it sounds very similar to here in Canada how it was in the early two thousands, um, and specifically that's because what I remember first starting off in jiu-jitsu, how there was uh, you know academy rivalries and uh, one academy would host a tournament, but then people wouldn't go because they wouldn't get along yeah. with the academy owner and whatnot. That's kind of faded in Canada, and I think jiu-jitsu is really coming closer together, and everyone's a little bit more open to cross training. Do you think that there's anything that can be done in the Dominican Republic to kind of get get that vibe going and schools closer together or no it's strange here um like you know all of the accomplishments that my instructors made here you know like world champion and he's pretty much put jiu-jitsu on the map here and uh it's like i don't know it's really weird how they don't dominicans don't support each other mm. you know it's a bold statement that's really true you know like we had alex garcia in the ufc you know, and, and people, all you would see on threads here is people talking shit about him, you know, when he when he lost and stuff, you know. you think people would support their, their own person, you know, their own countrymen, but it's really strange here for that. Huh. So it's, I, I think it'll always kind of be problems with, with, with jiu-jitsu here. Yeah. And it's, it's bad because judo is huge here and so many other sports are really breaking out and jiu-jitsu is not because of the, you know, the political stuff. Right. How uh, do you have any uh, what, any means to be able to go out and get new students? Do you find that that you rely on uh, a lot of word of mouth? Do you any type do to, to any type of publicity or things like that to try to get some new students in the academy? Well, we got um, where I, where my academy is is one of the largest tourist destinations in um, the Caribbean. I think right now we just took over number one over the Bahamas. Oh wow! So we uh, I get a, a big influence of tourists. So every week. I'm getting four to, to eight tourists from all over the world. You don't get a lot of Russians in here. We get a lot of, a lot of people from Canada, a lot of people from the States. Um, so, you know, and then uh, pretty much everybody that lives here is foreign because Punta Cana is such a tourist-like town. So a lot of people from Spain, a lot of people from, from all over the world. So I really, you know, I've got like a couple billboards, things like that here. But to be honest with you, I don't really... I think the worst thing that could happen to my jiu-jitsu would be for me to have 50 students. Right. You know, because they're paying students that I have to devote my time to to make them better. And I think it, I'm not done competing, you know, and, and I'm not done being a student myself. So I have a small group that we learn together and kind of grow together, and I like it that way. Nice. And when did you realize that you wanted to open up your own academy? I didn't. <laughs> <laughs> I, I still don't want to. It's such a headache, you know. Right. I, I probably, like, like, I say this to my students all the time. If a black belt better than me moved here and opened an academy, I would close mine in a heartbeat and go be a student. <laughs> you know, I, I my jujitsu took such a big dive when I started becoming an instructor, but it was just there was, you know, the only way I could keep jujitsu going here was to just open an academy and, like I say, have training partners because just nobody else was around here doing it. You know, I mean, I, I can't go to the capital and train. Um, you know, it's too far for me to go but maybe a couple of times a week you know right do you do you, do you find yourself going back home at any point or go or traveling to the states uh, often to go train at different yeah. gfts or whatnot yeah i just uh i got back um 
I've been back, I think, two weeks. I was in Georgia for about a month doing seminars down there and um, and training a lot. Uh, I was supposed to do a super fight on submission hunter and ended up uh, having uh, a disagreement with the uh, guy I was supposed to face. He wanted more money last minute, so that never never came through. Oh. But um, like Georgia, too, is another place. You know, South Georgia, like around Savannah area, jiu-jitsu, you know, uh, it, it's growing pretty good around there. So like, there's a lot of seminars I was doing there and a lot of training I got when I was there. So it was, it was good. It was enjoyable. And I do – I go to the States probably every other month either for a competition or to uh, – like I say, do a seminar or, or just go back home because my family's still in the states as well. Okay. okay. And do you uh, do you, do you have a special? So you specifically go to Georgia when when you are in the states? Well, that's where my family lives. Right. So I, I, I spend a lot of time there. Okay. But no, I, I go all over. Okay. Have you have, you, a, have you spent any ahead. time in California? Yeah, I did. We actually, me and my instructor, went on a seminar tour. We went from Vegas. And went all the way down through uh, to San Diego and just doing seminars, you know, one after another. Oh, I really cool. enjoyed California a lot. Hmm, that's cool. And ha- have you ever been in Canada? No, I, well, I, I've competed in Canada. No, I haven't done any seminars there. I, I went to, um, I competed in Brampton, right outside of Toronto. Right. Yeah, I, I, I was actually born in Brampton. I think it's the ghettoest city in Canada. I yeah. Think. <laughs> it's pretty bad. <laughs> I'll tell you what, though, I enjoyed it a lot, and um, just around Toronto, I couldn't believe what a clean city it was, and I like how culturally diverse it is. You know, there's so many people from everywhere that just kind of mesh together and get along, you know? Right. No, definitely. I'll, we'll definitely have to spread the word to try to get some academy owners to get you out here to Canada, maybe maybe in, in about a month, because we still have snow on the ground, and you want nothing to do with that, trust me. Yeah, no, I, <laughs> I definitely don't miss that at all. <laughs> So what what kind of advice would you give uh, an experienced grappler and maybe uh, maybe a purple belt or a brown belt who's looking to kind of fill in the gaps to his game or create his own game? What's something that that uh, that kind of helped you mold everything together? Do you were, were you doing something specific? Were you getting advice of your instructor? Or? Take privates, buy instructionals. It's worth the money, um, and also uh, realizing you're not that good. You know, that's one of the, the turning points in, in my jiu-jitsu is when I realized I'm not as good as I think I am. You know, that's nobody wants to admit that they're that, that, that they suck or they don't they don't have a good guard or whatever. But when you come to grasp with the flaws you have in your game, that's the only point and the only time you can actually really grow. Did you, did, did you find yourself, a, have you always worked the closed guard when you were, were you a purple and a brown? Was that kind of like your go-to thing and you built off of that? No, because like I was saying, I started out with the, with a De La Hiva school and we did a lot of open guard, a lot of spider guard. And I used to have a really good spider guard. I mean, I still have a, a very good open guard, but it got to the point where, you know, my hands were kind of taking a lot of damage, like you were saying, with, uh, with the open guard and stuff. And I, you know, open guard is a really, um, how do you say, you're, it's a vulnerable position. You know, you open and you're trying to work, but you really put yourself at a lot of risk. Because if what you try doesn't work, you're getting passed for sure. Right. You know what I mean? And, and, and you have to be a lot more aware, a lot more guard retention. As for a close guard, it's something that you can really, you know, systematically break your opponent down. You know, you can start with, with making that first grip, breaking their posture, you know, doing something to make their arm cross center line. Next thing you know, you're attacking arm bar sweeps and so on. You know, I just feel with time, it's really gravitated towards me. I'm a, I'm a really laid back kind of person. And they say a lot of times that your jujitsu game can like kind of reflects on your personality. And I think that's kind of why I choose close guard. You know, you ever notice the hyperactive guy in the gym? You know, that's really the guy that loves passing guard. You right. know, he's the real aggressive, you know, type. So, I don't know, I'm real passive, laid back, and I think that kind of reflects in my jiu-jitsu as well. Nice. Do you, do you, do you have any people, any BJJ uh, people that you like to watch or watch videos of or instructor uh, instructionals or things like that? Do you have any go-to guys that you love watching their, their matches or their things? Man, like I said, I've gotten so many arguments online with Gordon Ryan and <laughs> things back and forth, but this dude is a genius. I mean, I literally have, like... Uh, nothing but the utmost respect for his jiu-jitsu. I mean, he's for sure uh, 
you know, I think there'd be no way he'd win worlds at, at, if he got a gi and all that. But this dude could. He's he's really a phenom. I mean, that that whole squad right there, the way they break down techniques and everything. I mean, really, really, really good. Nice, nice. Him, nice. and then, you know, guys like, I mean, dude, Hodger Gracie. I mean, come on. You know, that's that's my guy. Right. Like, I, I could watch this guy all day, every day, because all it is is just basic jiu-jitsu. And look what he did to Bouchesha. Bouchesha, no matter what he wins, he can win 20 uh, um, world championships, and he'll never be considered better than uh, Hodger. Right. And, I mean, Hodger just shut all of that down with basics. It always comes back to the fundamentals, right? Yeah. That's really interesting. So maybe just uh, give a shout out to everybody and maybe tell, uh, I don't know if you have any sponsors or let people know where your academy is. So if ever people are down in your area, they could definitely stop by. Yes, uh, definitely Ronan Brand Geese, Douglas Lee with Ronan. Man, this guy supported me since I was a purple belt and always been there for anything I need jiu-jitsu wise. Think Fit Apparel, they're one of the fastest growing um, athletic brands in the business. And they, they produce a great product with an even better message, you know. They've really been supportive of me. Black Belt CBD, damage control, mouth guards. Uh, man, and then uh, our school, it's located in uh, Punta Cana, Dominican Republic. We're also putting together camps. We do uh, camps about every other year we've been doing it. Last one we did, we had Cyborg here, my instructor, and Hadolfo Vieja. So we bring some high quality guys to these camps and dude it's paradise man everybody's welcome you know come down here and train and it's paradise and perfect training environment it's like brazil except a lot cheaper <laughs> nice <laughs> nice well professor thanks very much for being on the show i appreciate your time we got it together and there hasn't been many trucks in the background so i think everything is good when it comes to audio quality <laughs> and uh we, we, we're we wishing you all the best and definitely uh if i'm down in putagana i'm going to come down and i tell uh, i'll tell everyone to, to drop by and see professor Caleb if they get a chance follow him on facebook on instagram he's got great youtube videos and instructionals up there too if you guys want to check him out so thanks again for being on our show and uh, we'll talk to you real soon professor thank you brother it's been an honor You've been listening to Let's Talk Jiu-Jitsu with Raymond Terrence. Go follow us on Facebook and Instagram. And don't forget to subscribe to our YouTube page. Turn on notifications and press that like button. Thanks for listening. We'll see you on the mat.